Welcome to the pandemic edition of the Maker's Workshop, where you get to see my face. While we're all stuck in a kind of lockdown and pause, a very surreal situation to be in, I thought I'd share some of the things I like doing other than making, and one of them is reading. There are a lot of authors and a lot of books that have really affected me over time, and one of them is a absolutely wonderful author. His name is Neil Gaiman. And I'd like to thank Neil because I reached out to him on Twitter and asked if I could read a chapter from one of the books that he's written that's had a fairly good impact on my life. I really enjoyed reading it and I, it got me into an entire genre of uh, fantasy that I didn't know really existed. The book is Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere. Neverwhere is a book about an alternate London that lives a little bit beside, a little bit underneath, and in another reality, right next to the one that we have here. A little like the situation we're in now, it feels completely unreal on top of something that is. What I would like to do is read the uh, dedication of the book, and then a little forward by the author, and the first chapter. If you'd like to read this edition of Neverwhere, it's available uh, on Kindle. It's also available as an ebook, and of course, you can get it in good old paperback fashion from your online bookseller. All right, let's get to it. The dedication for Lenny Henry, friend and colleague, who made it happen all the way, and Merrily Heifetz, friend and agent who makes everything good. Introduction to the text. It's a good bet that even if you've read Neverwhere before, you haven't read this edition of Neverwhere before. Neverwhere began life in the way that these things do as a television series I was asked to write for the BBC. And while the show that was broadcast was not necessarily a bad television series, I kept finding myself bumping up against the fact that what one saw on screen simply wasn't what I had in my head. A novel seemed the easiest way to get what I'd had in my head into the insides of other people's heads. Books are good that way. Neverwhere as a novel began for me as we started making the BBC TV series of the same name, more or less as a way to keep my sanity. With every scene that was cut, every line that vanished, Everything that was simply changed, I denounced, not a problem, I'll put it back in the novel, and thus regain my equilibrium. This went on until the day that the producer came over and said, we're cutting the scene on page 24, and if you say, I'll put it back in the novel, I'll kill you. After that, I only thought it. What I wanted to do was write a book that would do for adults what the books I'd loved when younger books like Alice in Wonderland or the Narnia books or the Wizard of Oz did for me as a kid. And I wanted to talk about the people who fall through the cracks, to talk about the dispossessed using the mirror of fantasy, which can sometimes show us things we've seen so many times that we never see them at all for the very first time. I started writing the novel on the day we started shooting the TV series, in January, in the kitchen of the South London flat in which we were filming. I finished it in May, in a hotel, in a small town in Southern California. It was published in August of that year by the BBC. When Avon Books wanted to publish it, I jumped at the chance to, in essence, do a second draft of the novel. I locked myself in a hotel room in New York City's World Trade Center, and I wrote for a week adding material for Americans who might not know where Oxford Street was or where you'd find if you walked down it, and enjoying the opportunity to revisit the text, expanding and deepening it wherever I could. My editor at Avon Books, Jennifer Hershey, was a terrific and perceptive editor. Our major disagreement was the jokes. She didn't like them and was convinced that American readers would not be able to cope with jokes in a book that wasn't meant solely to be funny. She wanted the second prologue gone too, in which we got to meet Krupp and Vandemar for the first time before the story began. And although I missed it, I decided that she was right and moved the description of them into the text. 
It's reprinted here, at the back, in its original form, for the curious. By the time I was finished, I'd added around 12,000 words and cut several thousand different words. Some of the words I was happy to lose, others I missed. This version of Neverwhere, assembled from various drafts of the book with the aid of Pete Atkins from Hill House Publishers, combines the original UK text and the US text. And then I removed a few of the redundancies and created a new, and I hope definitive, version of Neverwhere, along with a headache for bibliographers. No kidding, Neil. Still. I don't write sequels. Still, the world of Neverwhere is one that I hope, one day, I'll return to. In a book called The Lost Rivers of London, I read about a brass bed found one day in a sewer. And to this day, no one knows where it came from, or how it got there. I bet Decarabus knows. Neil Gaiman Prologue The night before he went to London, Richard Mayhew was not enjoying himself. He had begun the evening by enjoying himself. He'd enjoyed reading the goodbye cards and receiving the hugs from several not entirely unattractive young ladies of his acquaintance. He'd enjoyed the warnings about the evils and dangers of London and the gift of the white umbrella with a map of London Underground on it that the lads had clubbed together to buy him. He had enjoyed the first few pints of ale. Then, with each successive pint of ale, he found that he was enjoying himself significantly less. Until now, he was sitting and shivering on the sidewalk outside the pub in a small Scottish town, weighing the conflicting merits of being sick and not being sick, and not enjoying himself at all. Inside the pub, Richard's friends continued to celebrate his forthcoming departure with an enthusiasm that, to Richard's way of thinking, was beginning to border on the sinister. He sat on the sidewalk and held on tightly to the rolled-up umbrella, and wondered whether going south to London was really a good idea. "'You want to keep an eye out,' said a cracked old voice. "'They'll be moving you on before you can say Jack Robertson.' Or taking you in, I wouldn't be surprised. Two sharp eyes stared out from a beaky, grimy face. <laughs> You're right. Yes, thank you, said Richard. He was a fresh-faced, boyish young man with a dark, slightly curly hair and large hazel eyes. He had a rumpled, just woken-up look to him, which made him more attracted to the opposite sex than he would ever understand or believe. <laughs> the grimy face softened. Yeah, poor cool thing, she said, and pushed a fifty fence piece into Richard's hand. How long you been on the streets, then? I I'm not homeless, explained Richard, embarrassed, attempting to give the old woman her coin back. P please, take your money. I'm fine. I just came out here to get the air. I go to London tomorrow. She peered down at him suspiciously, and then took back her fifty pence and made it vanish between the layers of coats and shawls in which she was enveloped. "'I've been to London,' she confided. "'I was married in London. But he was a bad lot. My mam told me not to go marrying outside. But I was young and beautiful, although you'd never credit it today, and I followed my heart.' "'I'm sure you did,' said Richard, embarrassed. The conviction that he was about to be sick was starting slowly to fade. That lot of good it's done me. I've been homeless, so I knew what it's like, said the old woman. That's why I thought you was. What you going to London then for? I've got a job, he told her proudly. Doing what? she asked. Um, securities, said Richard. I was a dancer, said the old woman, and she tottered awkwardly around the sidewalk, humming tunelessly to herself. Then she teetered from side to side like a spinning top coming to rest, and finally she stopped, facing Richard. Hold out your hand, she told him, and I'll tell you fortune. He did as he was told. She put her old hand into his and held it tightly, and then she blinked a few times, like an owl who'd swallowed a mouse that was beginning to disagree with it. 
You've got a long way to go, she said, puzzled. London, Richard told her. Not just London, the old woman paused. Not any London I know. It started to rain then, softly. I'm sorry, she said. It starts with doors. Doors? She nodded. The rain fell harder, pattering on the roofs, on the asphalt of the road. I'd watch out for doors if I was you. Richard stood up, a little unsteadily. All right, he said, unsure of how one ought to treat information of this nature. I will. Thanks. The pub door was opened, and light and noise spilled out onto the street. Richard, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'll be back in a second. The old lady was already wobbling down the street, into the pelting rain, getting wet. Richard felt he had to do something for her. He couldn't give her money, though. He hurried after her down the narrow street, and the cold rain drenching his face and hair. Here, yeah, said Richard. He fumbled with the handle of the umbrella, trying to find the button that opened it. And then a click, and it blossomed into a huge white map of the London Underground Network, each line drawn in a different color, every station marked and named. The old woman took the umbrella, gratefully, and smiled her thanks. You've a good heart, she told him. Sometimes that's enough to see you safe where you go. Then she shook her head. But mostly it's not. She clutched the umbrella tightly as a gust of wind threatened to tug it away from her, or pull it inside out. She wrapped her arms around it and bent almost double against the rain against the wind. Then she walked away into the rain and the night a round white shape covered with the names of London tube stations, Earl's Court, Marble Arch, Blackfriars, White City, Victoria, Angel, Oxford Circus. Richard found himself pondering, drunkenly, whether there was really a circus at Oxford Circus, a real circus with clowns and beautiful women and dangerous beasts. The pub door opened once more, a blast of sound as if the pub's volume control had been just turned up high. Richard, you wanker! It's your bloody party and you're missing all the fun! He walked back into the pub, the urge to be sick, lost in all of the oddness. "'You look like a drowned rat,' said someone. "'You've never seen a drowned rat,' said Richard. Someone else handed him a large whiskey. "'Eh, get that down, yeah. They'll warm you up. You know, you won't be able to get real scotch in London.' "'I'm sure I will,' sighed Richard. Water was dripping from his hair into his drink. "'They have everything in London.' And he downed the scotch. And after that... Someone bought him another. And the evening blurred and broke up into fragments. Afterwards, he remembered only the sense that he was leaving somewhere small and sensible that made sense. For somewhere huge and old that didn't. And vomiting interminably into a gutter flowing with rainwater somewhere in the small hours of the morning. And a white shape marked with strange colored symbols like a little round beetle walking away from him in the rain. The next morning, Richard got on the train to London for the six-hour journey south that would bring him to the strange gothic spires and arches of St. Pancras Station. His mother gave him a small walnut cake that she had made for the journey and a thermos flask filled with tea. And Richard Mayhew went to London, feeling like hell. Chapter One She had been running for four days now. A harumskarum tumbling flight through passages and tunnels. She was hungry and exhausted and more tired than a body could stand, and each successive door was proving harder to open. After four days of flight, she'd found a hiding place, a tiny stone burrow under the world, where she would be safe, or so she prayed. And at last, she slept. Mr. Croup had hired Ross at the last floating market, which had been held in Westminster Abbey. Think of him, he told Mr. Vandemar, as a canary. Things? asked Mr. Vandemar. I doubt it. I sincerely and utterly doubt it. Mr. Croup ran his hand through his lank orange hair. No, my fine friend, I was thinking metaphorically, more along the lines of the birds they take down the mines. 
Mr. Vandemar nodded, comprehension dawning slowly. Yes, a canary. Mr. Ross had no other resemblance to a canary. He was huge, almost as big as Mr. Vandemar, and extremely grubby and quite hairless. And he said very little, although he'd made a point of telling each of them that he'd like to kill things. And he was good at it. This amused Mr. Croup and Mr. Vandemar, much as Genghis Khan might have been amused by the swagger of a young Mongol who'd recently pillaged his first village, or burnt his first yurt. He was a canary, and he never knew it. So Mr. Ross went first, in his filthy t-shirt and his crusted blue jeans, and Croup and Vandemar walked behind him in their elegant black suit. There are four simple ways for the observant to tell Mr. Croup and Mr. Vandemar apart. First, Mr. Vandemar is two and a half heads taller than Mr. Croup. Second, Mr. Croup has the eyes of a faded china blue, while Mr. Vandemar's eyes are brown. Third, while Mr. Vandemar fashioned the rings he wears on his right hand out of the skulls of four ravens, Mr. Croup has no obvious jewelry. Fourth, Mr. Croup likes words, while Mr. Vandemar is always hungry. Also, they look nothing all, all, at all alike. A rustle in the tunnel darkness. Mr. Vandemar's knife was in his hand, and then it was no longer in his hand, and it was quivering gently, almost thirty feet away. He walked over to his knife and picked it up by the hilt. There was a gray rat impaled on its blade, its mouth opening and closing impotently as the life fled. He crushed its skull between his finger and thumb. "'Now there's one rat that won't be telling any more tales,' said Mr. Croup. He chuckled at his own joke. Mr. Vandemar did not respond. "'Rat. Tales. Get it?' Uh, Mr. Vandemar pulled the rat from the blade and began to munch on it, thoughtfully, head first. Mr. Croup slapped it out of his hands. "'Stop that!' he said. Mr. Vandemar put his knife away a little suddenly. "'Buck up!' hissed Mr. Croup, encouragingly. "'There'll always be another rat. Now, onward. Things to do. People to damage.'" Three years in London had not changed Richard, although it had changed the way he perceived the city. Richard had originally imagined London as a grey city, even a black city, from pictures he had seen, and was surprised to find it filled with color. It was a city of red brick and white stone, red buses and large black taxis, which were often, to Richard's initial puzzlement, gold or green or maroon. Bright rust post boxes and green grassy parks and cemeteries. It was a city in which the very old and the awkwardly newly jostled with one another, not uncomfortably but without respect. A city of shops and offices and restaurants and homes, of parks and churches, of ignored monuments and remarkably unpalatial palaces. A city of hundreds of districts with strange names. Crouch End, Chalk Farm, Earl's Court, Marble Arch. And oddly distinct identities. A noisy, dirty, cheerful, troubled city which fed on tourists needed them as it despised them, in which the average speed of transportation through the city had not increased in 300 years, following 500 years of fitful road widening and unskillful compromises between the needs of traffic, whether horse-drawn or more recently motorized, and the needs of pedestrians, a city inhabited by and teeming with people of every color and manner and kind. When he had first arrived, he had found London huge, odd, fundamentally incomprehensible, with only the tube map, that elegant, multicolored topographical display of underground railway lines and stations, giving it any semblance of order. Gradually, he realized the tube map was a handy fiction that made life easier, but bore no resemblance to the reality of the shape of the city above, like belonging to a political party he thought once, proudly, and then having tried to explain the resemblance between the two map and politics at a party to a cluster of bewildered strangers, he had decided in the future to leave political comment to others. He continued, slowly, 
by a process of osmosis and white knowledge, which is like white noise, only more informative, to comprehend the city. A process which accelerated when he realized that the actual city of London itself was no bigger than a square mile, stretching from Aldgate in the east to Fleet Street and the law courts of Old, Barley, Old Bailey in the west, a tiny municipality, now home to London's financial institutions, and that was where it had all begun. Two thousand years before, London had been a little Celtic village on the north shore of the Thames, which the Romans had encountered and settled in. London had grown, slowly, until roughly a thousand years later it met the tiny royal city of Westminster immediately to the west. And once London Bridge had been built, London met the town of Southwark, directly across the, ri Southwark, directly across the river, and it continued to grow, fields and woods and marshland slowly vanishing beneath the flourishing town. And it continued to expand, encountering other little villages and hamlets as it grew, like Whitechapel and Deptford to the east, Hammersmith and Shepherd's Bush to the west, Camden and Islington to the north, Battersea and Lambeth across the Thames to the south, absorbing all of them as it grew, just as a pool of mercury encounters and incorporates smaller beads of mercury, leaving only their names behind. London grew into something huge and contradictory. It was a good place and a fine city, but there is a price to be paid for all good places and a price that all good places have to pay. After a while, Richard found himself taking London for granted. In time, he began to pride himself on having visited none of the sights of London, except for the Tower of London, when, when his Aunt Maud came down to the city for a weekend and Richard found himself her reluctant escort. But Jessica changed all that. Richard found himself, on otherwise sensible weekends, accompanying her to places like the National Gallery and the Tate Gallery, where he learned that walking around museums too long hurts your feet, <laughs> the great art treasures of the world all blur into each other after a while, and that it is almost beyond the human capacity for belief to accept how much museum cafeterias will brazenly charge for a slice of cake and a cup of tea. Here's your tea and your clare he told her. It would have cost less to buy one of those Tintorettos. Don't exaggerate, said Jessica cheerfully. Anyway, there aren't any Tintorettos at the Tate. I should have had that cherry cake, said Richard. Then they would have been able to afford another Van Gogh. No, said Jessica accurately. They wouldn't. Richard had met Jessica in France on a weekend break in Paris two years earlier and had in fact discovered her in the Louvre, while trying to find the group of his office friends who had organized the trip. Staring up at an immense sculpture, he had stepped backwards into Jessica, who was admiring an extremely large and historically important diamond. He tried to apologize to her in French, which he did not speak, and so gave up, and began to apologize in English, and then tried to attempt to apologize in French for having his apologize in English, until he noticed that Jessica was about as English as it was possible for any one person to be, by which time she had had him buy her an expensive French sandwich and some overpriced fizzy apple juice by way of apology, and, well, that was the start of it all, really. He had never been able to convince Jessica that he wasn't the kind of person who went to art galleries after that. On weekends, when they did not go to art galleries or museums, Richard would trail behind Jessica as she went shopping, which she did, on the whole, in affluent Knightsbridge, a short walk and an even shorter taxi ride from her flat in Kensington News. Richard would accompany Jessica on her tours of such huge and intimidating emporia as Harrods and Harvey Nichols, stores where Jessica was able to purchase anything from jewelry to books to the week's groceries. Richard had been awed by Jessica, who was beautiful, and often quite funny, and was certainly going somewhere. And Jessica saw in Richard an enormous amount of potential, which, properly harnessed by the right woman, would have made him the perfect matrimonial accessory. If only he was a little more focused, she would murmur to herself, and so she gave him books with titles like Dress for Success, and 125 Habits of Successful Men, and books on how to run business like Military Campaign, and Richard always said thank you, and always meant to read them. In Harvey Nichols' men's fashion department, she would pick out for him the kinds of clothes that she thought he should wear. And he wore them, 
Mm, during the week, anyway. And a year to the day after the first encounter, she told him she thought it was time they went shopping for an engagement ring. Why do you go out with her? asked Gary in corporate accounts 18 months later. She's terrifying. Richard shook his head. She's really sweet once you get to know her. Gary put down the plastic troll he'd picked up from Richard's desk. I'm surprised she still lets you play with these. The subject has never come up, said Richard, picking up one of the creatures from his desk. It had a shock of day-glow orange hair and a slightly baffled expression, as if it were lost. The subject had indeed come up. Jessica had, however, convinced herself that Richard's troll collection was a mark of endearing eccentricity, comparable to Mr. Stockton's collection of angels. Jessica was in the process of organizing a traveling exhibition of Mr. Stockton's angel collection, and had come to the conclusion that great men always collected something. In actuality, Richard did not really collect trolls. He found a troll on the street outside the office, and in a vague and pretty vain attempt at injecting a little personality into his uh, working world, he would placed it on his computer monitor. Uh, the others had followed over the next few months gift from colleagues who had noticed that Richard had a penchant for the ugly little creatures. He had taken the gifts and positioned them strategically about his desk, beside the telephones and the framed photograph of Jessica. Today, the photograph had a yellow post-it note stuck to it. It was a Friday afternoon. Richard had noticed that events were cowards. They didn't occur singly, but instead they would run in packs and leap out of him all at once. Take this particular Friday, for example. It was, as Jessica had pointed out to him at least a dozen times in the last month, the most important day of his life. Not the most important day of her life, of course. That would come one day in the future when Richard had no doubt they would make her prime minister or queen or god. But it was, without question, the most important day of his life. So it was unfortunate that, despite the post-it note Richard had left on his fridge door at home, and the other post-it note he had placed on the photograph of Jessica on his desk, he'd forgotten about it. Completely. And utterly. Also, there was the Wandsworth report, which was overdue and taking up most of his head. Richard checked another row of figures, and then he noticed that page 17 had vanished, and he set to print out again, another page down, and he knew that if he were only left alone to finish it, if miracle of miracles, the phone did not ring. It rang. He thumbed the speakerphone. Hello, Richard. The managing director needs to know when he'll have the report. Richard looked at his watch. Five minutes, Sylvia. It's almost wrapped up. I just have to attach the PNL projection. Thanks, Dick. I'll come down for it. Sylvia was as she liked to explain, the M.D.'s P.A. And she moved in an atmosphere of crisp efficiency. He thumbed the speakerphone off. It rang again. Immediately. Richard, said the speaker with Jessica voice. It's Jessica. You haven't forgotten, have you? Uh, forgotten? He tried to remember what he could have forgotten. He looked at Jessica's photograph for inspiration and found all the inspiration he could have needed in the shape of a yellow post-it note stuck to her forehead. Richard, pick up the telephone. He picked up the telephone, reading the post-it note as he did so. Sorry, Jess. No, I hadn't forgotten. 7 p.m. at my Masson Italiano. Should I meet you there? Jessica, Richard, not Jess. She paused for a moment. After what happened last time, I don't think so. You really could get lost in your own back garden, Richard. Richard, contemplating, point out that anyone could have confused the natural gallery with the natural portrait gallery, and that it wasn't she who had spent the whole day standing in the rain, which was, in his opinion, every bit as much fun as walking around either place until his feet hurt. But he thought the better of it. I'll meet you at your place, said Jessica. We can walk down together. Right, Jess, Jessica, sorry. You have confirmed our reservation, haven't you, Richard? Yes, lied Richard, earnestly. 
The other phone in his desk had begun to ring, shrilly. Jessica, look, I... Good, said Jessica, and she broke the connection. The largest amount money Richard had ever spent on anything had been spent on Jessica's engagement ring, 18 months earlier, at one of Harrod's many jeweler concessions. He picked up the other phone. Hi, Dick, said Gary. It's me, Gary. Gary sat a few desks down from Richard. He waved at Richard from his own gleamingly troll-free desk. Are we still on for drinks? You said we could go over to the Meshtum tonight, uh, the Meshtum account. Get off the bloody phone, Gary. Of course we are. Richard put down the phone. There was a telephone number at the bottom of the post-it note. Richard had written the post-it note to himself several weeks earlier, and he had made the reservation. He was almost certain of it. But he had not confirmed it. He had kept meaning to, but there had been so much to do, and Richard had known that there was plenty of time, but rents run in packs. Sylvia was now standing next to him. Dick, the Wandsworth report. Almost ready, Sylvia. Look, uh, just hold on a sec, can you? He finished punching in the number, breathed a sigh of relief when somebody answered. Mamison, can I help you? Yes, said Richard. A table for three for tonight. I think I booked it. And if I did, I'm confirming the reservation. And if I did, didn't, I wondered if I could book it. Please. No, they had no record of a table for tonight in the name of Mayhew, or Stockton, or Bartram, uh, Jessica's surname. And as for booking a table, it wasn't the words that Richard found so unpleasant. It was the tone of voice in which the information was transmitted. A table for tonight should certainly have been booked years before, perhaps, it was implied, by Richard's parents. A table for tonight would be impossible. If the Pope, the Prime Minister, and the President of France arrived this evening without a confirmed reservation, even they would be turned out into the street with a continental jeer. But it's for my fiancé's boss. I don't know if I should have phoned in before. There are only three of us. Can't you please... And they had put down the phone. Richard, said Sylvia, the MD's waiting. Do you think, asked Richard, they'd give me a table if I phoned back and offered them extra money? In her dream, they were all together in the house. Her parents, her brother, her baby sister. They were standing together in the ballroom, staring at her. They were all so pale, so grave. Portia, her mother, touched her cheek and told her that she was in danger. In her dream, Dor laughed and said she knew. Her mother shook her head. No, no, she was in danger. Now. Dor opened her eyes. The door was opening. Quietly, quietly, she held her breath. Footsteps, quiet on the stone. Perhaps she won't notice me, she thought. Perhaps he'll go away. And then she thought desperately. I'm hungry. The footsteps hesitated. She was well hidden, she knew, under a pile of newspapers and rags. And it was possible that the intruder had meant her no harm. Can't he hear my heartbeat? She thought. And then the footsteps came closer. And she knew what she had to do, and it scared her. A hand pulled the covers off her, and she looked up into the blank, utterly hairless face, which creased into a vicious smile. She rolled, then, and twisted and the knife blade aimed at her chest, caught her in the upper arm. Until that moment, she'd never thought she could do it, never thought she would be brave enough or scared enough or desperate enough to dare. But she reached up one hand to his chest, and she opened. He gasped and tumbled onto her. It was wet and warm and slippery, and she slithered and staggered out from under the man, and she stumbled out of the room. She caught her breath in the tunnel outside, narrow and low, and as she fell against the wall, breathing in gasps and sobs, that had taken the last of her strength. And now she was spent. Her shoulder was beginning to throb. The knife, she thought. But she was safe. My, oh my, said a voice from the darkness on her right. She survived Mr. Ross. Well, I never, Mr. Vandermar. The voice oozed. It sounded like gray slime. Well, I never either, Mr. Croup, said a flat voice on her left. A light was kindled and flickered. Still, 
said Mr. Croup, his eyes gleaming in the dark beneath the earth. She won't survive us. Door need him. Hard. In the groin. And then she began, randomly, to run, her right hand holding her left shoulder. And she ran. Dick! Richard waved away the interruption. Life was almost under his control now. Just a little more time. Gary said his name again. Dick! It's the 6.30. It's what? Papers and pens and spreadsheets and trolls were tumbled into, brief into Richard's briefcase. He snapped it shut and ran. He pulled on his coat as he went. Gary was following. Are we going to have that drink, then? A drink? We were meant to be getting together this evening to talk about the Merstam account, remember? That was tonight? Richard paused for a moment. If ever he decided they made a disorganization an Olympic sport, he could be disorganized for Britain. Uh, Gary... He said, I'm sorry, I blew it. I have to see Jessica tonight. We're taking a boss out to dinner. Mr. Stockton? Of the Stocktons? The Stockton? Richard nodded. They hurried down the stairs. I'm sure you'll have fun, said Gary, insincerely. And how is the creature from the Black Lagoon? Jessica's from Ilford, actually, Gary. And she remains the light and love of my life. Thank you very much for asking. By which time they were in the lobby, and Richard made a dart for the automatic doors, which spectacularly failed to open. It's after six, Mr. Mayhew, said Mr. Figgis, the building security guard. You have to sign out. I don't need this, said Richard to no one in particular. I really don't. Mr. Figgis smelt vaguely of medicinal liniment, and was widely rumored to have an encyclopedic, encyclopedic collection of softcore pornography. He guarded the doors with a diligence that bordered upon madness, never quite having lived down the evening when an entire floor's worth of computer equipment upped and left, along with two potted palms and the managing director's Axminster carpet. So our drink's off, then? I'm sorry, Gary. It's Monday, okay, for you? Sure, Monday's fine. See you Monday. Mr. Figgis inspected their signatures and satisfied himself that they had no computers, potted palms, or carpets on their persons. Then he pressed a button under his desk, and the door slid open. Doors, said Richard. The underway branched and divided. She picked her way at random, ducking through tunnels, running and stumbling and weaving. Behind her strolled Mr. Croup and Mr. Vandemar, as calmly and cheerfully as Victorian dignitaries visiting the Crystal Palace exhibition. When they arrived at a crossroads, Mr. Croup would kneel and find the nearest spot of blood, and they would follow it. They were like hyenas, exhausting their prey. They could wait. They had all the time in the world. Luck was with Richard for a change. He caught a black taxi, driven by a particularly enthusiastic taxi driver who took Richard home by an unlikely route involving streets that Richard had never previously noticed, while holding forth, as Richard had discovered all London taxi drivers will hold forth, given a living, breathing, English-speaking passenger, on London's inner-city traffic problems, how best to deal with crime, and the thorny political issues of the day. Richard jumped out of the cab, leaving a tip in his briefcase behind, managed to flag down the cab again before it made it onto the main road and so got his briefcase back. <laughs> briefcase back. Then he ran up the stairs and into his flat. He was already shedding clothes as he entered the hall. His briefcase spun across the room and crash-landed on the sofa. He took his keys from his pocket and placed them carefully on the hall table in order to ensure that he did not forget them. Then he dashed into the bedroom. The buzzer sounded. Richard, three-quarters of the way into his best suit, launched himself at the entry phone. Richard, it's Jessica. I hope you're ready. Oh, yes. Be right down. He pulled on a coat and ran, slamming the door behind him. Jessica was waiting for him at the bottom of the stairs. She always waited for him there. Jessica didn't like Richard's flat. It made her feel uncomfortably female. There was always the chance of finding a pair of Richard's underwear, well, anywhere, not to mention the wandering lumps of congealed toothpaste on the bathroom sink. No. It was not a Jessica kind of place. Jessica was very beautiful. So much so, Richard would occasionally find himself staring at her, wondering, how did she end up with me? And when they made love, 
which they did at Jessica's muse flat in the fashionable Kensington, in Jessica's brass bed with the crisp white linen sheets, uh, for Jessica's parents had told her that Eiderdown were decadent. In the darkness, afterwards, she would hold him very tightly, and her long brown curls would tumble over his chest, and she would whisper to him how much she loved him. And he would tell her that he loved her, and had always wanted to be with her. And they both believed it was true. Bless me, Mr. Vandemar. She's slowing up. Slowing up, Mr. Croup. She must be losing a lot of blood, Mr. V. Lovely blood, Mr. C. Lovely wet blood. Not long now. A click. The sound of a switchblade opening, empty and lonely in the dark. Richard, what are you doing? asked Jessica. Nothing, Jessica. You haven't forgotten your keys again, have you? No, Jessica. Richard stopped patting himself and pushed his hands deep into the pockets of his coat. Now, when you meet Mr. Stockton tonight, said Jessica, you have to appreciate that he's not just a very important man. He's also a corporate entity in his own right. I can't wait, sighed Richard. What was that, Richard? I can't wait, said Richard, rather more enthusiastically. Oh, do step lively, said Jessica, who was beginning to exude an aura of what, in a lesser woman, might also have been described as nerves. We mustn't keep Mr. Stockton waiting. No, Jess. Don't call me that, Richard. I loathe pet names. They're so demeaning. Spare any change? The man sat in a doorway. His beard was yellow and grey, and his eyes were sunken and dark. A hand-lettered sign hung from a piece of frayed string around his neck and rested on his chest, telling anyone with the eyes to read it that he was homeless and hungry. It didn't take a t sign to tell you that. Richard, hand already in his pocket, fumbled for a coin. Richard, we haven't got the time, said Jessica, who gave to charity and invested ethically. Now, I do want you to make a good impression, fiancé-wise. It's vital that a future spouse makes a good impression. And then her face creased, and she hugged him for a moment and said, Oh, Richard, I do love you. You know that, don't you? And Richard nodded, and he did. Jessica checked her watch and increased her pace. Richard discreetly flicked a pound coin back through the air toward the man in the doorway, who caught it in one grimy hand. There wasn't any problem with the reservations, was there? asked Jessica. And Richard, who was not much good at lying when faced with the direction, said, Eh. She'd chosen wrongly. The corridor ended in a blank wall. Normally that would have given her pause, would hardly have given her pause, but she was so tired and so hungry and in so much pain. She leaned against the wall, feeling the brick roughness against her face. She was gulping breath, hiccuping and sobbing. Her arm was cold and her left hand was numb. She could go no further. And the world was beginning to feel very distant. She wanted to stop to lie down and sleep for a hundred years. Oh, bless my soul, Mr. Vandemar. Do you see what I see? The voice was soft. Close. They must have been nearer to her than she imagined. I spy with my little eye something that's going to be. Dead in a minute, Mr. Croup, said the flat voice from above her. Our principal will be delighted. And the goal pulled whatever she could find deep inside her soul from all the pain and the hurt and the fear. She was spent, burnt out, and utterly exhausted. She had nowhere to go, no power left, no time. If it's the last door I open, she prayed silently to the temple, to the arch. Somewhere, anywhere, safe. And then she saw it wildly, Somebody. And, as she began to pass out, she tried to open a door. As the darkness took her, she heard Mr. Croup's voice, as if from a long way away. It said, Bugger! Blast! Jessica and Richard walked down the street toward the restaurant. She had her arm through his, and was walking as fast as her heels permitted. He hurried to keep up, 
Street lights and the fronts of closed stores illuminated their path. They passed a stretch of tall, looming buildings, abandoned and lonely, bound by a high brick wall. You're honestly telling me you had to promise them an extra fifty pounds for our table tonight? You are an idiot, Richard. Jessica, dark eyes flashing, was not even slightly amused. They'd lost my reservation, and they said all the tables were booked. Their steps echoed off the high walls. They'll probably have us sitting by the kitchen, sighed Jessica, or the door. Did you tell them it was for Mr. Stockton? Yes, replied Richard. Jessica sighed. She continued to drag him along as a door opened in the wall, a little way ahead of them, and someone stepped out and stood swaying for long, one long, terrible moment, and then collapsed onto the concrete. Richard shivered and stopped in his tracks. Jessica tugged him into motion. Now, when you talk to Mr. Stockton, you must make sure you don't interrupt him or disagree with him. He doesn't like to be disagreed with. When he makes a joke, laugh. And if you're in any doubt as to whether or not he's made a joke, look at me. I'll um, tap my forefinger. They'd reached the person on the sidewalk. Jessica stepped over the crumpled form. Richard hesitated. Jessica, you're right. He might think I'm bored, she mused. I know, she said brightly. If he makes a joke, I'll rub my earlobe. Jessica? He could not believe she was simply ignoring the figure at their feet. What? She was not pleased to be jerked out of her reverie. Look! He pointed to the sidewalk. The person was face down and enveloped in bulky clothes. Jessica took his arm and tugged him toward her. Oh, I see. If you pay them any attention, Richard, they'll walk all over you. They have homes, really. Once she's slept it off, I'm sure she'll be fine. She? Richard looked down. It was a girl. Jessica continued. Now, I've told Mr. Stockton that we... Richard was down on one knee. Richard, what are you doing? She isn't drunk, said Richard. She's hurt. He looked at his fingertip. She's bleeding. Jessica looked down at him, nervous and puzzled. We're going to be late, she pointed out. She's hurt. Jessica looked back at the girl on the sidewalk. Priorities. Richard had no priorities. Richard, we're going to be late. Someone else will be along. Someone else will help her. The girl's face was crusted with dirt and her clothes were wet with blood. She's hurt, he said simply. There was an expression on his face that Jessica hadn't seen before. Richard, she warned, and then she relented a little and offered a compromise. Dial 999 and an ambulance then. Quickly now. Suddenly the, girl eyes, the girl's eyes opened, white and wide, in a face that was little more than a smudge of dust and blood. Not a hospital, please. They'll find me. Take me somewhere safe, please. Her voice was weak. You're bleeding, said Richard. He looked to see where she'd come from, but the wall was blank and brick and unbroken. He looked back to her still form and asked, Why not a hospital? Help me, the girl whispered, and her eyes closed. Again he asked her, Why don't you want to go to the hospital? This time there was no answer at all. "'When you call the ambulance,' said Jessica, "'don't give your name. "'You might have to make a statement or something, "'and then we'll be late, "'and I'm not having this evening ruined by—' "'Richard, what are you doing?' "'Richard had picked up the girl, "'cradling her in his arms. "'She was surprisingly light. "'I'm taking her back to my place, Jess. "'I can't just leave her. "'Tell Mr. Stockton I'm really sorry, "'but it was an emergency. "'I'm sure he'll understand.' "'Richard Oliver Mayhew!' said Jessica coldly. You put that young person down and come here at this minute. Well, this engagement is as an, at an end as of now. I'm warning you. Richard felt the sticky warmth of blood soaking into his shirt. Sometimes, he realized, there's nothing you can do. He walked away. Jessica stood there on the sidewalk, watching him ruin her big evening, and her eyes stung with tears. After a while, he was out of sight, and then, and only then, did she say loudly and distinctly and unladylike, Shit! And flung her handbag as hard as she could onto the ground, hard enough to scatter her mobile phone and her lipstick and her planner and her handful of tampons across the concrete. And then, because there was nothing else to do, she picked it all up and put it back into her handbag and walked back down to the restaurant to wait for Mr. Stockton. Later, as she sipped her white wine, 
She tried to come up with plausible reasons why her fiancé was not with her, and found herself wondering desperately whether or not she could simply claim that Richard was dead. It was very sudden, said Jessica, wistfully, under her breath. Richard did not, at any point on his walk, stop to think. It was not something over which he'd had any volition. Something in the sensible part of his head, someone, a normal, sensible Richard Mayhew, was telling him how ridiculous he was being, that he should have just called a police or an ambulance, and that it was dangerous to lift an injured person, that he had really, seriously, properly upset Jessica, that he was probably going to have to sleep on the sofa tonight, that he was spoiling his only good suit, that the girl smelled quite dreadful. But Richard found himself placing one foot in front of the other, and arms cramping and back hurting, and ignoring the looks he got from the passerby, he just kept walking. And after a while, he was at the ground floor door of his building, and he was stumbling up the staircase. And then he was standing in front of the door to his flat, realizing that he'd left his keys on the hall table inside. The girl reached out one filthy hand to the door, and it swung open. Never thought I'd be pleased that the door hadn't latched properly, thought Richard, and he carried the girl in, closing the door behind him with his foot, and put her down on his bed. His shirt front was soaked in blood. She seemed semi-conscious. Her eyes were closed, but fluttering. He peeled off her leather jacket. There was a long cut on her left upper arm and shoulder. Richard caught his breath. Look, I'm going to call a doctor, he said quietly. Can you hear me? Her eyes opened, wide and scared. Please, no, it, it'll be fine. It's not as bad as it looks. I just need to sleep. No doctors. But your arm, your shoulder. I I'll be fine. Tomorrow, please. It was little more than a whisper. Um, I suppose, all right. And with sanity beginning to assert itself, he said, Look, can I ask? But she was asleep. Richard took an old school scarf from his closet and wrapped it firmly around her left upper arm and shoulder. He did not want her to bleed to death on his bed before he could get her to a doctor. And then he tiptoed out of his bedroom and shut the door behind him. He sat down on the sofa in front of the television and wondered what he had done. Thus ends Chapter 1 of Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. If you like this book and like what I've read, there is a lot more to this story, and it go takes place all over London, at Blackfriars, St. Pancras Station, the Underground. You learn all about the night market and about a fantastical world in a place under, but next to, a place you probably think you already know. Again, I'd like to thank Neil Gaiman for letting me read this chapter and have it for all of you to enjoy. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can find it at amazon.com. I will post a link to that. It's also available on Audible, so you can listen to somebody else read the rest of the book. Um, and there's a lot more like this. Now, if you like this, I've asked a few other authors if I can read a chapter of their books. Uh, please give me some feedback in the comments below. It's been my pleasure to uh, read this to you today. I hope you have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep making things. Bye. <music>